Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to Christ our Lord. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. When one of the two heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Good morning, everyone. Before I start my homily, I would just like to let you all know that um, if you haven't heard already, we have a new tabernacle in the 24-hour chapel that we have. So it's a new tabernacle where you can open it whenever you want, where you can have exposed adoration. So literally, you just go to the tabernacle, and if no one's in there, you just simply open um, the tabernacle, and you can have exposed Eucharistic adoration, where you can see the Eucharist. And so, if you don't even, some people don't even know we have a chapel. I mean, you should know that we have a chapel. So we have a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week chapel. And so I really encourage you during this year of the Eucharist that you can have exposed Eucharistic adoration whenever you want. And honestly, uh, adoration really has the potential of changing your life because I know how much it's changed my life, and I don't know if I would live without it. So just letting you know that we have that now. And the code is 5673. If you don't know that, it spells Lord on your cell phone, and so that's 24 hours, seven days a week. It's on this side of the church, and you'll see it. There's glass doors. And you can In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Today I want to ask you first a question. If someone was going to ask you, what is the difference between Christianity and all the other religions? What makes this one more true than other faiths? And so a good answer to that is, what are the chances that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament? What are the chances? There's over 300 prophecies, and not just the prophecies themselves, but events, actual historical events, which could be thousands of little events, all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What is the chances of that? The answer to that would be like one in... 10 quatillion times 10 quatillion, it would be like taking a quarter and flipping it on heads. Trillions and trillions and trillions of times it would have to land on heads. Those are the mathematical chances that Jesus could have fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. So basically, it's impossible, right? No other religion, no other faith does that, right? That actual events that were prophesied, are fulfilled in Jesus. So future events actually came true. And so I want to explain a little bit about this. So today we have John. 
he says something which is really a key to unlocking the whole Old Testament. So John is the last prophet, and he speaks new revelation to us. And so he says something very critical. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so that is mind-blowing, that is shocking that John could be saying a person is the Lamb of God. A person, right? No one ever believed the Messiah was going to be the Lamb of God. And so where do we get this? Where does John get this? Obviously, it's God is revealing it to him. But I wanted to share some Old Testament stories that if you're not familiar with, that really show that our our Bible is literally a miracle. So first, one of the first places, not the first one, but one of the first places where it talks about a lamb. So Abraham asks, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only beloved son, Isaac. Hopefully you know the story. So Abraham and Isaac are walking up Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And Isaac, he's about a teenager, he's about a teenager at this time, He's carrying wood on his shoulders and he looks at his father Abraham and says, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? And, and Abraham says to his son, God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. God is going to provide the lamb. And so, but he doesn't know that God has asked Abraham to sacrifice him. He doesn't know that. Uh, he doesn't know that, and if you ever hear a voice that says, sacrifice your child, please see a therapist, by the way. Um, don't do that. Um, we know that God does not want you to do that. So, God is telling Abraham to sacrifice his son, and Abraham's response is, okay, I will do whatever you ask. Behold, here I am, I will do what you ask. And so look at the imagery between Isaac and Jesus. First, Abraham says, God says to Abraham, sacrifice your most beloved son. Who is God the Father's beloved son? Jesus, right? Isaac is carrying wood up a mountain on Jerusalem. What does Jesus carry on his shoulders? Wood, a cross, up a mountain. Okay? Then, when Abraham is about to sacrifice him, he says, because you're willing to do this, and Isaac doesn't fight back, there's no indication Isaac fights back, just like Jesus doesn't fight back, and he's about to slay Isaac, and he says, no, stop. Because of what you're willing to do, I'm going to bless all the nations because of you are willing to give up your son. And so ultimately, there is no lamb in the whole scene. There is no lamb, even though Abraham says, God's going to provide a lamb. Then what happens? There's a ram. They find a ram that's right there, and there's a, a crown of thorns all wrapped around the ram. And the ram represents a king, because a ram is a symbol for a king, and he's wrapped in thorns, okay? So who is that typology? That would be Jesus. Jesus is the king that's going to be sacrificed, and there's thorns wrapped around him. And Jesus also will be sacrificed on, sacrificed himself on a mountain in Jerusalem. So you can see, during that time, no one ever believed that that was about the Messiah. No one even knew. So 2,000 years before Jesus, no one even knows that that's about Jesus. So I would say, how is that even possible? That a detailed story about the Messiah, he's going to be crowned with thorns, he's going to die in Jerusalem 2,000 years before Jesus even comes. Is that possible? I would say no. What religion does stuff like that? And I would say not only is it there, it's written in hundreds if not thousands of places all over the Old Testament, Jesus is hidden in the Old Testament even far more detailed than that, right? And so I bring that up because when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus and he saw two disciples after he had died and rose from the dead and they didn't know he was risen, they were walking around very sad. They were like, and he goes up to them, Jesus goes up to them, and he's like, what's wrong? Why are you guys downcast? Why are you sad? And he said to, they said to him, we thought that Jesus was going to be the Messiah, that he was going to be the Savior, but he died on a cross. So they don't even expect him to die on a cross. They don't even know what it means. And Jesus says to them, 
slow of heart are you to believe all that was written about me in the prophets. And so Jesus opened up to them the Old Testament and said, and showed them everything that was written about him that he was to suffer and to die and to rise for them. And it says their hearts were burning inside of them when Jesus did this. So sometimes when we're struggling with our faith, one way Jesus expects us to believe is that if you look at the Old Testament, these things are impossible. If you look at the beauty of the Old Testament, everything God is doing is about Jesus. Everything. Everything, everything, everything. And so it's important that if we're struggling with our faith, we could sometimes be like downcast, like those two um, disciples who are walking out to Emmaus. Because I don't see always the joy that's coming from knowing that Jesus has fulfilled all the prophecies, right? And that should bring us tremendous joy. Today we saw Andrew, and Andrew, when, when John says this is the Lamb of God, he doesn't know what that even means. He knows it must mean something, that he's pure, that maybe he's the Messiah. And he stays with, he stays with Jesus, and then he stays with him for the day, and then he realizes this is the Messiah, and what does he do? Immediately he goes looking for his brother, Simon, because he's like, we found him. We found the Messiah. And so I don't think sometimes we realize the joy of that in our own life because we kind of take it for granted. Like, I was born Catholic. I believe in Jesus. I was taught that in my first catechism lesson. Okay, I have a cross since my first bap my baptism. You know, I've been told. But the excitement of Jesus doing all of this should excite us and really cause our hearts to burn, saying, wow, Jesus, you are fulfilling the whole Old Testament. So sometimes when we want to realize there's more to that, um, I was going to explain to you, maybe I will explain to you, let's just, let's just go over another, another place. Another place. So one other, one other place that we should know about. 500 years after Moses was going to sacrifice, um, Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, God asks Moses, in the 10th plague of Egypt, he says, I want you to sacrifice a lamb. It has to be perfect. Not a bone of it can be broken. And you must eat the lamb, or I will kill every firstborn child of Israel. And they do this, and immediately they leave Egypt, and they go, they leave the land of sin, and they go to Holy Land, to the Holy Land. They're going to the Holy Land when he does this. What does Jesus do? He says, I'm the Lamb of God. You must eat my flesh unless there's no life in you. And my body and blood is leading you to the new holy land, out of the land of sin to the kingdom of God. So you can see how thousands and thousands of years, even in Genesis all over, God is literally saying to you and me, I'm giving you the Eucharist and it's taking you to heaven. And I am the Lamb of God and I'm going to feed you with my flesh. That is a miracle. That's impossible. No one would have ever known that the Lamb in in the Exodus was about Jesus. The entire Exodus story is about Jesus. And so the chances of that is impossible. The Bible is written by 40 different people. And the reason why you know it's true is because it's not written by one author. If the Bible was written by one person, you could say he knows the beginning, he knows the middle, and he knows the end. But because it's written by 40 people, they don't even know what they're writing. They don't even know what it means, what they're writing. And even the Pharisees and the scribes don't even know what these events even mean. And so that's why when John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that is mind-blowing. That is the key to understanding who Jesus is. And so that should bring us great joy when we're struggling in our faith and saying, Well, where is God? Because you can't just base God on personal experiences. Oh, I experienced God in prayer. Because that's subjective. Like, even if I shared to you a personal experience, I experienced Jesus in the Eucharist. But that's subjective to my personal experience, right? So you have to test the spirit. Not everyone's encounter with what they think is God at times is God. And so how do we know Jesus is the truth? Well, one way you could say is that he fulfilled all the prophets, and that's how Jesus actually expects all of us to believe in him. And so that's why when we don't even know who the prophets are, we don't even know what they wrote, 
of course our faith is going to be like weak, right? Because Jesus actually expects us to know that. And so today let's pray and examine and think this new year as we've been, me and Father Pierre and everyone has been challenged everyone to read the Bible this year. Because when we do that, you will really know who Jesus Christ is. And when you receive him in the Eucharist, you can truly say amen. So whenever the Eucharist minister, by the way, I've been meaning to say this, whenever the Eucharistic minister or the priest says, the body of Christ, what do we say? Amen. Usually I don't hear people, people are nodding or people are just like, you know, you know, we want to say amen and we can't know who it is that we are receiving and we must know, unless we know the word of God so that when I say amen, I say, Jesus, I know you. I know what you've done for me. I know you are the Lamb of God. I know you are the Savior. So let's pray today asking Jesus to give us greater faith in everything that he's done for us. Amen.